Uh, we are in chapter four. We're on the bottom of page 186, uh, where it says, okay. Okay. Basically, in this chapter, we're discussing and trying to gain further insight into the mitzvah of Teshuvah. We're going back to, we finished all the discussions of the previous chapter, one, two, and three, regarding fasting. Now we're going back to understand the essence of Teshuvah. And we said, to truly appreciate the mitzvah of Teshuvah, we have to f- first understand what we did. Meaning, when someone does a sin, the first step is to understand what was done. What was the, what was the unfortunate or tragic or painful reality? And then you could say we're sorry. For an example, if someone doesn't realize what they did, when someone hurts someone's feelings, for just a simple example would be, somebody makes a light comment or a joke to somebody without realizing the person just went through a very difficult time exactly with that subject. And you think the person thinks I just made a silly comment that wasn't so nice to me, done. But if they would stop and realize how much pain they caused because they brought up a very painful subject with a relative or a family or a divorce, whatever the matter was, as soon as they realize that, suddenly the apology is a whole different apology. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I did not mean to do so much damage. or I'm so, I realize how much hurt I caused, how much pain I caused. Now it's a different apology. In other words, the Alter Rebbe wants us to understand what someone's doing to Shuva. In order to return and to change, we have to fully appreciate what happened here. What type of damage? What did I do? So we're going back now and examining what is the effect of a sin? What happens when someone does a sin? What is the process? To so appreciate that, we have to first talk about what's in Hashem. Who are we? And we examine ourselves and our identity and our story and who we are. Then we can go back and realize, one second, I just tarnished that. You know, if someone spills a little bit of ketchup on a, a shirt or on a, something which costs, you know, $30, it's one level of apology. If you realize this is a priceless shirt that was someone inherited from a grandparent or got from some place, uh, expensive wedding gown, suddenly, wow, I didn't realize, wow, this is different. The, the apology is different. So the altar is going to go and examine now, what is the soul? Who are we? To appreciate this, he starts off with a verse on the bottom of page 186. But we really asked, to, to get to this point, we asked a question. And the question is as follows. We described and said that there's something called the punishment or the the uh, the response or the penalty or the uh, result of a sin called karis or misa mayam. When someone passes away either before 50 or before 60. And the altar asked a question last week. Why is it that we see so many people, God, unfortunately, who do certain sins, who seem to have done sins like, you know, chametz on Pesach or sins that carry such a serious punishment like Karis, and they live happy, good lives till right. 80, 90, 100, 110 years old. And not only that, not only they don't die, but they seem to have, you know, we might say, well, the person had a difficult life. To me, it looks like they're living the, the fun life, the happy life, the good life. What, why? Not that we're, God forbid, complaining, like saying it's not fear. <laughs> we're, it's more like, how, does the system work? We actually find a very similar discussion in the Talmud. Um, good morning. The Talmud discusses um, that there's four punishments that the courts get, administer. Four death punishments. Stoning, there's uh, um, choking, there's uh, uh, beheading. You know, there's different, different, um, different commandments, different uh, punishments. Uh, four deaths. And we said that since the temple was destroyed, that uh, Hashem, the courts no longer do it, but Hashem finds a way for it to happen. Someone did a sin that des- the deserves God for it to be burnt, they'll be, they'll be bitten by a snake, which was like a heat, a poison, etc. Someone who's supposed to be this, they'll have a choking, they'll God for it drown or something. Some very sad, you know, discussion of the Talmud. So the Tosh was asked a question, one second. We see people who do these sins, and they live happy lives. They die in their bed at the age of 107. You know, what? I don't know if those days lived 107, but he says, it seems not to have worked. And there he gives a whole other answer. And he says, the answer is because sometimes a person does the shuva. And you don't know about this, but a person who repented, Hashem cleared the, cleared the punishment. So he, gives, he asks a similar question. We don't see the Hashem sort of carry out justice. And he answers because sometimes a person does the shuva, a person who regrets it is hard and the punishment is waived. The Alder Rebbe doesn't give that answer, and the Rebbe in the discusses the difference between the four punishments and of the court administers and the punishment, God forbid, of uh, where where Karis or Misa Vadesh Mayim, a person dies young, and he explains one of them is more of a judgment where the court has to go and do something, 
and there's a process of judgment, and one of them is really a, a case of automatic. You know, we discuss about a, a punishment for a sin. There's two ways the Talmud discusses, or actually Hasidus gets into, how does a punishment work for a sin? Someone did a sin and there's a punishment. Is it that the court sort of goes and says, okay, Mr. X and Mr. A did such a sin, and now we have to administer a punishment? Or is it automatic? Like if you touch a hot coal, the punishment is not that, okay, you know what? Now we're going to make you burn your hand. That's what happens. You burn your hand. You you, you, put, you touch boiling hot or you, um, you, know, you eat something you shouldn't. The punishment is that you get a stomachache. It's not a punishment that someone judges you. It's the natural result. And this whole discussion in the in Chassidus, the Rebbe explains the difference between these punishments, why the Talmud asks the question only on the four, the four punishments of the court, and why in this case the Alter Rebbe discusses only the case of death in the hands of God, curse, and uh, Misa Shemayim. But the bottom line is, our question that he asked in a few minutes ago was, in the, uh, were the last lines before today's class, how come we don't see today these punishments go into effect? In order for the Alter Rebbe to answer that, he's going to go and give a long insight into the soul, into the story of a, a person who we are as a Jew. That's what we're doing today. Okay, bottom of page 186. It says in the verse in the Torah that the Jew is a part of Hashem. Hashem, a part of God. Amoy is his nation. That's who we are. And by the way, it says here, v'chulu, which is very interesting to note in general. We're going to find that uh, whenever you have an expression that's not from the Bible, not from the Torah, the, ex- the way we say etc. in Hebrew is v'chulu. Whenever it's a quote from a verse in the Torah, the way we say etc. is v'gleimer. V'gleimer means, and the, and the apostle continues, God, God spoke. What's interesting here, it says v'chulu, it's a, it's a mistake. Now, the mistake either happened in the transcribing or the printing at some place, but the rabbit points out this is a mistake. It should be here for Gleimer, and we'll see it again on the next page. I don't know why, and I was trying to find some interest or insight why in this subject we have twice on this page the by mistake the etc. is written Vichulu, etc. instead of a Gleimer, which is for our verse. And I didn't see an answer, but it's interesting. Twice we have on this page, so it should be here for Gleimer, etc. as a verse. That's why you'll notice sometimes it says Vagleimer, sometimes it says Vichulu. It depends if we're quoting a verse. Or quoting the Talmud or quoting some other source. Anytime it's the Pasuk, it says V'gleimer. Anytime it's a verse or a Talmud, uh, anytime it's a Talmud or some other source, it says V'chulu. Rabbi, I thought V'chulu was it, for example. No, V'chulu means etc. Et v'chulu, etc. Et yeah. uh, okay, uh, if it says Ukedoime, would be in, for an example. Wasn't that written by his sons? Yeah, but the question is where the mistake happened. His sons wrote this, yeah, yeah. put this together. Well, it's taken from his writings, yeah. But they put it together, yes. Um, so the Pasuk says, for the Jewish people are a part of Hashem. Now, just to give a sneak preview or give a picture ahead, we're going to focus on three points, what is unique about the Jewish soul, the Yid, the Shem of a Jew, versus all, all other creation. And I'm just going to explain in advance so we know where we're going with this. Everything in the world was created with the Shem Elikim. Barishis Bar Elikim. We know God. We spoke in the last section, in the whole section of Shariq of Amuna, a lot of talk about Havaya, God's name Yud K Vav K, and God's name Elikim. One is the name of we have relation, revelation of Chesed, one is Gevura, which is concealment. Yud K Vav K Havaya is revelation, and Elikim is more concealment. It's two levels how Hashem expresses himself into the world. We're going to see that all of creation was created by Elikim a much more concealed level of godliness. The soul of a Jew was created by Havaya. And we'll see that uh, as part of the discussion here. Second thing we're going to point out, how everything in the, of creation was created with what's called chitzonius, the external part of God's essence. You can say such a thing. God's more of an external expression. The Jewish soul, the Jew, the Jew created with the epinemius, the essence of God, more internal. And finally, we're going to find that all of creation was created with speech and the soul of the Jew was created with breath. Mm-hmm. What's oh, the difference? Right. What's the difference in speech and breath? It says all of creation Hashem created with let there be light, speech, let there be this, let there be that. We'll explain the difference. And the soul of man was created by breath. It says, and God breathed into his nostril, nostrils the breath of life. Hashem blew into the into Adam, life. And we know that was a soul that Hashem gave the, the neshama of a Jew into uh, Adam, that's what's transmitted to all of us today. 
So our souls are a much more deeper, more profound, more essential part of Hashem than any other creation in the world. That's the first thing we're going to go with in the next part of this chapter, explaining that we are a unique creation than every other creation. And not just of you know, other creatures or other uh, animals or other plants or other, you know, things in this world, even celestial beings, even angels, we are higher and more essential part of God than even the angels in heaven. And we're going to go into that for a few minutes also in this chapter. Okay. So it says, We are a part of God's name, Havaya. And we're going to go into it a few minutes and explain the word shame here. We know in general, Whenever we have the word shame, name, it doesn't mean the essence of something. It means it's something disconnected. You have the thing and the name of the thing. While we know in Hasidus, we learned many times, the name of something reveals and expresses the essence of something and is a channel of life force. Like we said, you know, the famous discussion we had, what was the genius of Adam to name everything? So Adam gave a name to every creature in the world. Why is that such genius? Anyone can go and name things. Call a horse, whatever you call everything in the world a name. Why is that so difficult? The answer is a name is not just a name. How you know what, what's what? That's the table, that's the chair. A name is a life force. In the letters in Hebrew, shulchan, kisei, bias, uh, all the words, uh, even <laughs> milk or chalav or behemoth, so every animal, every, every creation is a life force of the letters of the uh, 10 utterances that Hashem said, create the world is a, form, a formula which gives its life. At the same time, it's not the thing itself. A name in function is not required by a person. You very rarely do you use a name. A name is really required for someone else. If, As a matter of fact, if you were the only person on this planet, you would need a name, technically speaking. Why? Who, uh, what do you need a name? You're the guy. You're the person. You know. So what's the purpose of a name? A name is really for other. So a name is really a concealment of you. So we're going to discuss in a few minutes. We'll get back to it. Once we introduce the part about the angels, we'll come back to this part here and ask, why does it say here, ki chelik mishem havaya, from the name havaya? It should be chelik me havaya. And we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Okay. But I want to first introduce the second half of this chapter in order to explain what you want to discuss here. So we said it's, ki chelik mishem havaya baruchu. How do we know it's part of havaya? We say Avayu we mean more essential essence part of God. It says when God created Adam, Hashem breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so what does that show? So the Zohar translates and explains. This is a quote from the Zohar. Somebody who blows. This is the correct for Cholub. Someone who blows, blows from his essence. When you want to uh, speak, speaking comes from your soul. Speaking comes from your soul, as we mentioned in the beginning of Tanya. Your soul has 10 powers and three sort of interfaces, <laughs> the garments of the soul, the way it interfaces with the world. And the soul interfaces with thought, speech, and action. So speech is one of the powers that the soul uses to express itself when you want to express a thought. You want to express a feeling. You want to express intellectual feelings. You want to express an emotional expression. All that comes from speech of the soul. So this, everything comes from the soul. The difference is, for the soul to exert itself to speak is a much less of an exertion than blowing. So if you want to speak, you could speak, and we see it for hours. People could sit on the bus, on a train, in a car, in a, in, a, in a restaurant, in a coffee shop, and talk for three, four hours without realizing it. Talk is some exertion, especially if you're talking emotional stuff, it takes more exertion, but you could talk a lot. Blowing is only a limited amount you can do without getting exhausted, especially if you're blowing with force. Blowing is a so only a certain amount I could do. And like if someone ever had to fill up a balloon for a party before they invented all these automatic blowers and inflators, if someone has to you know, do some sort of exertion, it's, you see blowing takes energy. Why? Because blowing comes from within. It's a much greater exertion of the soul. In other words, which is more soul giving of itself? Speech is one level. Another deeper, much more exerting and much more expressive soul itself is blowing. So when Hashem created Adam and he blew into his nostrils life, he actually blew more of himself. Now, obviously, Hashem doesn't have a breath. Hashem doesn't have a, 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 a deep effort of blowing. But we're talking, everything we describe Hashem is a metaphor to understand on some level an idea. So Hashem speaks in human terms and the Torah speaks in human terms. But we know what does it mean, just like by a human being. When we want to blow, it takes effort come from within. Same thing when Hashem uses the expression blowing, it means Hashem is giving more of an essence. So since it says that by the only creative force in the world, the only creation 
that it says blowing is the soul of man. So we say Hashem's essence was put into man much more than anything else. The Zohar says, Now, even though God doesn't, God forbid, you can't say Hashem has some sort of body. Hashem has some sort of, uh, hello, Hashem was blowing, like, you know, like Hashem said, let there be light. It was, let there be light. <laughs> Hashem didn't say anything. Speech is a concept. What is speech? I have a thought inside of me. I have a feeling inside of me. And you don't know what it is. And when I speak, I reveal it. I reveal what I'm thinking. I reveal what I'm feeling. So what is speech really? Revealing to the outside what I'm feeling. But at the same time, speech only shares a very limited amount. When I'm going to speak, I might have a very deep, painful feeling of some experience I had in life. If I tell you about it, I'm only sharing a, a fragment of it because the true feelings words can't express. Say it with a deep intellectual thought. We say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Why is that? Because to explain something takes much more words than just many more words than, than seeing it. In other words, as I'm speaking, I'm limiting myself. I'm, I'm limiting the thought. It's like they say, always be careful by a kiddish or by an event to say thank yous. Once you start thank yous, you're in trouble. Who do you leave out? You have to mention every single thank you. Why? Because now you got to detail each thing. So it's easier to leave things out because it's much more restrictive. Thank yous meaning I ended up only thanking these 11 people instead of thanking, thank you, everybody. So the more you talk, the more you're limiting. So at the same time, Hashem's creative force of the creation, on one hand, was revealing a revelation that Hashem revealed like speech, it reveals. At the same time, it was a very restrictive creation because it was concealing truly what I was feeling. It, meaning it was truly, uh, it was restricting truly the essence of my thought or feeling. So you have that the word, the dibur, is a, is a two-faced thing. On one hand, it reveals. At the same time, it conceals. And that's exactly what the words were. Hashem said, let there be light. On one hand, he shared of himself to be light. But what did he share? A very tiny fragment, a tiny uh, shadow of himself because speech automatically restricts. That's why we use the example of speech in creation. <laughs> so that's what he says here. <laughs> that, but Torah speaks, top of the next page, Sadiq Talmud. But Torah speaks in the language of the human beings. What does that mean? If we want to understand godly ideas, no difference than we said many times when we have a map. And on the map, you want to have an indication what's a, um, a state highway and what's a county highway and what's a, um, you know, a city road. It might be one is blue, one's red, one's green. But it doesn't mean when you get there, one's blue, one's that mean, hey, I see the green roads here and the blue roads here. On the map, we do it as a way to understand what we're talking about. But it doesn't mean that you get there. So it doesn't mean that Hashem actually blew or Hashem actually spoke. These are expressions, these are colors we're using, so to speak, just to give an idea of what we're talking about. So why do we use these metaphors in creation of speech and blowing? He says, very simple. As if it's simple, but it's simply. Just like there's a very big difference by a person, but Adam atachtin by a human being here in this world, because we, when we say well, Hashem created us in His image, we are Adam atachtin. We are the bottom person. There's also Adam elyon, all the spheres, chachma, bina, das, chesed, vur, teferes, the whole creation, the whole function of Ashtoshlos. That's of the creation, the order of creation. That's called Adam elyon. So Adam atachtin, the physical person, and the reflection of the big picture. But there's a big difference when Hevel, she eats the Pib, the Buddha. There's a big difference in the person's uh, ear that comes out of their mouth when they speak. Compared to when you're blowing. When a person blow, uh, sorry, speaks, he's only giving and his, and his soul essence is very, he uses two words here. Ma'at mezir. Ma'at means a little, mezir means small. And he's using a double expression. When you speak, you're only giving of your soul a small little, meaning a small amount of yourself. And not just that. You're only giving of the external part of your soul. Your soul is a fire. It's a generator. It's a, it's a battery. It's the, it's, the, it's the power force of who you are. It's your, it's your motor. It's your, it's your essence. It's your core. When you speak, you're only sharing the external part of your core because everything that happens in the world is a reflection of the truth. Just like we say, when snow comes down and it's white and it's cold, it's cold and white because snow in its source represents a level of, let's say, chesed, which it is. That's the color of chesed is more white. And, and each of the aspects of, of the nature of snow is a reflection of how it is in its source, what snow is spiritually. Everything in this world is a reflection of some spiritual concept. Same thing, when you have to express a stronger uh, effort 
an exertion to give ear from your soul, that means I'm expressing much more essence of my soul. When I don't have to take when I don't take as much effort, less effort, I'm expressing less of my soul, which means more external. A person has, whenever you're involved in something, you can be involved in it fully there and externally. Sometimes you're listening to something, you know, when you're working in your office and you're listening to um, something on the radio or recording, and you're only partially listening. You know, sometimes someone comes in the room and tells you something. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an external connection. And sometimes you, you close your phone, you close your computer, you close your book, and you say, yes, what do you want? Now I'm present. There's a big difference between involved with something focused, I'm here, or I'm uh, externally involved. Same thing is with a soul. A soul external level is just speech. Now, speech is not nothing. Speech created heavens and earth. Speech created everything we see, but compared, compared, comparatively, speech is a much more external, a much uh, more uh, diminished and uh, limited expression of soul compared to um, exerting effort and blowing. And that's why you see one takes much more of self and one doesn't because it's a reflection of what you're really expressing. So when you speak, it's coming out, is ear, very small and a very a limited amount. It's only an external part of your essence of your soul, even though it's from your soul. But when someone blows, and not just blows, the altar adds on a word here with strength. There's two ways to blow. You can blow, and then you can blow with strength. You know, sometimes they go to a doctor's office, they want to do a test on you, they put a little ball, and there's a little mm-hmm. thing you got to blow. Yeah. And there you got to blow, and it's, it's not easy. So blow, and then you're exhausted. What happened? You're sitting in a chair. You didn't walk anywhere. You haven't gone up a staircase. You haven't, you know, run a marathon. And you're sitting out of breath from blowing a little ball. The ball is like weighs you know, <laughs> one gram, one ounce. I don't know what it weighs. Why? Because blowing is is the is the effort. It takes effort. You're blowing, and that's what it, that's what the sham is. And the sham is, so to speak, God blowing with effort into us. Therefore, in that case, it's a much more essential or essence or, or per, um, inside part of the soul. The same thing is true, sort of as a metaphor, to understand, but with many, many more times, infinite times greater, the difference between by Hashem creating the lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, compared to creating the soul of man. He said there's a very big difference. Lamaila above, and we'll discuss this word later. We'll come back to this word again. Why it says Lamaila here. Between all the um, creations, the whole host of things that are in heaven, which means the sun, the moon, the stars. Because to understand, we sometimes look and have a very, very um, crit- critical look of the idea of people who worship idols. The way you say worshiping idols in technical terms of the Talmud is is people who worship the stars and the constellations. Mm -hmm. And we look at it as uh, correctly so, as a very sad or unfortunate or foolish or unhealthy or or evil uh, way to serve, so to speak, um, service, to worship the stars. But where does that come from? It came from, the Rambam explains to us, the earlier generations realized that the stars and the constellations had tremendous wisdom, brilliance, power, and influence on the world. And they do. Your destiny is like they say written in the stars, except Jews are above destiny. But the reality is Hashem gave over no different than a teacher who was giving out snacks to the kids. And he takes one kid and he says, okay, uh, here's a box of cookies. Go give all the kids cookies. Um, And that's even different, actually, because there, actually, the child has some free choice. But it's, it's it's the conduit that we use to um, to share something, Hashem shares the flow of life into the world through the stars because they're very high and elevated power. It said the Ramah writes, they're very intelligent, they're very spiritual, they're very they're very uh, uh, elevated creations, but they're only servants. So the, the metaphor we use is, it's like a hammer or like a mixer in the kitchen. If you go into the kitchen and you go to the uh, mixer and say, wow, you made such a good cake. You made such a good, delicious uh, kugel. Uh, you're a fool. The chef is standing here. He didn't. The, the, the mixture did nothing. Same thing. It says Hashem uses these tools, but the, so on one hand they're very, very lofty. Sorry. Just touch on that. Did so when in the time when people did worship them, did their prayers or their uh, toward, directed towards the stars change the 
power the tails the, or the, the what was coming through the stars excellent excellent question it's a very very good question mm -hmm. There's actually a mimer that became one of what, what, is, still, what is known as one of the more famous mimer, but they're actually famous because we learned it a lot and it's a very essential message called Biyem Ashdei Asriyem. It's a mimer the Rebbe said uh, on one of his birthdays. And the Rebbe goes to analyze the difference between the Jews who pray to God directly and, so to speak, nations of the world that pray through, I mean, many nations pray to God too, but those who pray through the stars and the moon, why they do it? And what does that mean? And, what's the, and what do they gain? And it says they gain, actually, it's, he gives a metaphor of someone trying to go instead of to the king to get what well, you should go through one of the ministers on the side and say, listen, I, my house, you know, I want to change the, some zoning laws. I want to I want to get some extra government funds. You're not going to the king. You're going through a side channel. And sometimes it seems like you can get more. You can achieve more. But in the long run, not. That's the, one of the key points of the Mima there. One of the, one of the points there. The bottom line is a person who chan uses those channels can sometimes elicit power. I don't want to say blessings because it's not a blessing, but elicit you know resources and and um, uh, flow of uh, supplies, so to speak, ashpa, uh, you know, get some sustenance through the stars. But it's unhealthy source and it exists today, even in the world now. There are ways to um, tap into spirituality in an unhealthy way. Spirituality just means, in this case, above natural uh, process, getting some spiritual source or force to help me. Today, the only places you find it really are South America, maybe in the Far East, that people still have the abilities to tap into these impure forces. So that concept is real. You could tap into these forces if you know a lot of spiritual and um, how to tap into it. But it's unhealthy, it's impure, and it's temporary, the good. But the concept does exist, especially back then. Back then, you know, uh, one of the interesting ideas, as a side note, about idol worship and worshiping, we today look back and say to ourselves, how are people so foolish to bow down to the sun, the moon, the stars, especially people bow down to wooden uh, statues and stone statues and, and people made out of clay. What was wrong with them? How foolish were they? We don't know the tremendous spiritual high they got. Today, I don't know what examples we can give inside, unless someone uses some sort of uh, synthetic you know, form of inspiration, like a drug, where you can get a massive high. They got such a spiritual high from this because they were able to tap into energies. So it was like an easy high. You know, one of the, the rebel ones told somebody what's wrong with taking like marijuana and stuff because it's a fake high. It's, it's false. It's, it's, all, it's all not real. It was an absolute high they got, an absolute spiritual experience where they walked away unbelievably powerfully inspired and, and uplifted, but in a very false way. In other yeah, words... Today also, like Christians, they go to the churches and they have the statues. Uh, so sometimes, yeah. So sometimes they could find... Yeah, you might find it also in America to a certain amount, but the real forces today, I think, are found like in South America. I know, I don't want to get into it now, but I have an uncle, Dini side, uh, Rabbi Halpern, who was, uh, he was for 50 years in Chabad of Brazil. He once told me a story how he actually was involved with the case absolute spiritual connections communicating with the dead from this non helping a family out that was very involved with this but the bottom line is they had the ability to communicate with the dead and talk to souls i mean real the famous story we all know from the the navi of the prophets the story of shol and the witch when shol wanted to talk to shmuel Hal navi and he wasn't having prophecy he wasn't able to tap into him he actually went to a witch which at that time they actually went and killed all the witches but they went to he went to a witch uh, a real and they got in touch and brought down Shmuel Navi's soul. Shmuel Navi's soul came down through this witch, which is, it's forbidden the Torah to do this, but it's a powerful concept. But again, we're not talking about that, we're just, just as a side note, note, I just wanted to mention that the, the uh, sun, the moon, and the stars are not light beings. They're major force, powers of um, force to be reckoned with, really have an effect. That's how people are able to look at the stars and see the future. The star, and we have the story of Moshe Rabbeinu, where the star gauge look into the stars and see the future. They, it's written in the stars. What do you mean it's in the stars? <laughs> what stars? When stars? There's a certain amount. So we're saying like this, even the creations of the heavens were all created only with speech. The sun, the moon, the stars, the constellations, all speech, man, the Jew, with breath. Not just that. The angels, he says, the angels in heaven, the malachim and all the seraphim and all the high angels, they're lofty, crazy, I, don't, I mean crazy, I mean un, the incredible angels with speech, and thus we're created with, with breath. So getting, he's giving an idea of who we are, our souls. He said like this, back inside. 
Yesh hefresh otsum eidla maila is a massive big change above. Bein kol, I'm not saying difference above. Bein kol tzva shemayim, all the hosts of the heavens, like the sun, the moon, and the stars. Ve'afilu hamalachim shenivru ma'ayin leyesh v'chayim v'kayamim. Ve'pchinas chetzunis hachayes v'ashefa shemashpia ein sey varchu. And they are all created with the external part of God's essence. Imagine this. They are created with the external part of God's essence. That's only called by God's speech. All of creation, all the highest, loftiest parts, like it says, like I said, Hashem created all of these um, created, created hosts of the heavens. He created with just speech. And those refer to all the power that was influenced and infused with the ten utterances that Hashem uttered to create heavens and earth and all its created um, beings inside of it. Can I ask you another question? Yeah. You know, the science is, is very much into like uh, the moon and the, the comet constellations and the stars and they you know really doing a lot in this area is that uh, does anything to is that affects somehow you mean people who look at the horoscopes you mean like this no, not no. The horoscopes. they fly fly there they oh the know, fact that oh the fact yeah, that today we interact with yeah, these uh, beings yeah. good question i don't know that's an interesting question I don't think it influences or changes stuff, but I don't know. I don't know. They, they do so much about it. I, I always. I'm it's interesting. Excited. Much success. Yeah, yeah. Healthy and successful, and easy recovery, mm -hmm. easy. and quick. And easy fast. <laughs> so there's a huge difference with, with all the created beings that Hashem created and included the angels and all the hosts of heavens. And the human and the and the sham of a Jew. And now he says here, Remember, we said in the previous um in the previous uh, section called Shah If you remember in chapter eleven, good number to know in general, chapter eleven, it's explained there the difference between or what the what not, not the difference, but what was happening by the ten utterances. He says, even though everything comes from Hashem's essence. But the ten utterances are really how Hashem created all of created beings through the utterances, which means he went through like a filter. In other words, Hashem didn't just create with the energy of his essence. He created the energy of his essence flowing through vessels that sort of diminished it. Almost like um, uh, going through a funnel or going through, a, I don't know what would be a fair word to use. But Hashem basically put all of this, it wasn't the spheres directly. It was a spheris that went through the letters, which are more of a concealment. As you mentioned, every time you have a word, it conceals a certain amount of the source. Like we said before, if you have a feeling and I talk about it, I'm never going to fully express it. Same thing, Hashem, when he created, not only did it come from a lower part of himself and his essence, but it came through the vessel or the concealment of the words. And that was all of creation, including angels, etc. Because it says, it says in Tanya, section 2, which is chapter 11, over there. Which is unique from the soul of man that comes from the essence of Hashem. And it, it came down in a way of absolute the essence of Hashem being shared, as you mentioned, through the idea of blowing. So it wasn't just a, even though just is not a fair word, it wasn't just words of Hashem, it was the breath of Hashem. And then he says, this is, we're going to stop with these two lines and go back and explain a bunch of sections here. But something else happened interesting, fascinating. Even though Hashem created our souls with uh, the breath of blowing, which is a much more powerful essence of self being shared, nevertheless, he then went, and we know, Part of the ten utterances, Nasa Adam Bitsalmenu, let us create man in our image. Which is interesting. When it says create man, it doesn't just mean his body, it means his soul. Man is not, we are not a, a bunch of you know biological matter. We are a biological matter infused with a soul. So when it says let us create man, it refers to the body and the soul. And it says a speech about it, meaning in addition to the fact that Hashem blew 
from his nas- he blew into the nostrils of Adam. He blew a soul. He said, then he said, let us make man. So it seems like he went now and did the creation through the filter of words. And yes, <laughs> Hashem created man and the soul through the filter of words after he blew into the nostrils, which means we have two things here. Number one, we're a different sort of creation than everything else. Number two, it's not seen. It's an absolute state of concealment. And this is critical to understand for the whole picture they want to discuss here in this chapter. That while it's true, we are created in the absolute breath of Hashem, which is a much stronger creation. Nevertheless, it's not seen. And we're going to explain it with three questions, but let's go back for a second to the word that says Lamaila. It said above, if you go back to, it's about the 10th line, the first word on the line is Atsum. Atsum. Yeah, thank you. It says, Yesh hefresh atsum eid lamayla. There's a big difference above. See, we want to talk about the soul down here. Why we say there's a big difference above. If I want to say, for an example, um, that someone comes uh, to, let's say, a shliach, the rabbi, comes to a city, and he does certain things, and you say, yeah, before you left town, you were really, really dedicated and great. You want to talk about how you are over here. Why we say before you, before you left New York? You want to talk about the person, how he is here. Why are we saying the soul of Mila is so great? We just talk about the soul down here, how it's so great. When it comes down to this world, of course, everything comes from Hashem, which is so great. So the Alter Rebbe really is bothered by three things. Number one, we find that throughout our lifetimes, we need to come on to angels for help. We need to sometimes turn to angels, to Malach Mechael. We turn to angels to get to, even though we say in the Brich Shemay before we open up, take out the Torahs, we open the Aaron Kodesh, we say, Hashem, I don't want to come onto the help of not a man and not an angel. I want directly from you and I thank directly you for all my blessings. Nevertheless, <clears throat> throughout life, sometimes a person has to come to the help of another man. Sometimes you need the help of the sun, the moon, and the stars. What does that mean? I need the nourishment. I need the, I need the blessings that come from heavens, the, the, the dew, the rain. I need to come on to. Angels for help. After angels have to come. You know, angels that come and assist us. Why do we find if we're loftier and greater in the essence of God versus the words of God, why do we turn to the angels for help? <clears throat> How can angels help us? It's like the, it's a similar question we ask, which is a whole nother discussion. Why higher beings need to come on to lower beings for sustenance? It's an interesting thing. We find a fascinating thing that, you know, the world is divided into four categories. Daemon, which is the lowest inanimate. Sameach, plant life, Chai, which is uh, animal kingdom, and Adam, or Medaber, which is uh, human beings. Nevertheless, each one needs to come onto the lower level to exist. The plants need to come onto the domain of earth and water. The animals need to come onto the lower level of water and plants to eat and be sustenance. We, we need all of them. We need water, we need plants, we need animals to eat and survive. Why is it? And we explained that infused within them is a much deeper level, that they have whatever starts off higher, falls lower, and therefore the sparks of godliness, which are much, much higher, that fell all the way down into bread. That's why it says, that it's not my bread alone, but it's the word of God that's in the bread that we live. So that's an idea that's one place that we have to come on to lower levels. But here, why do we have to come on to angels if they're lower than us? That's first of all. Second of all, why do we find that angels are called oftentimes by God's names? It says the angels are called the Malachi Hashem, the, the, the um, angels of God, and all the names are godly names. They're called by Elohim or human beings. Be- no, but they also, that's, that's some of the names, but they're also called by names of God, the angels. Yeah. Gabriel. Gabriel, exactly. That's a, yeah. They have God in their name, but by, you, by Jews, we don't find that we're called by God. We're just called names of regular people. And finally, and then most importantly, if we're so lofty, how come angels could never go against God's will? Angels are programmed. They never did, never will, and can't possibly go against Hashem's will. They will always do what Hashem wants to the last dotting of the I and crossing of the T. The angels are perfectly aligned with God's will. No, Us, that, not so much. But animals. But angels can't do anything wrong. That's a very unique, special case where the angels requested to try and be like man. They came into the world of man. They came down. And actually, um, you'll see the answer to that question with the answer that Alter gives here. That's a good question. And you'll see the answer that we answer this here. We'll answer that question too. Good, good, good question. But it's a talk, those are angels that fell down. So, but uh, good point. 
the feeling about the angels that came down at times of uh, the early generations that they wanted to experience, they said, we want to be all human beings too. And God said, you couldn't handle it. And they came down, they were the worst, uh, the troublemakers. They, they gave giants. So the last thing, the third thing was, how come if we're so lofty and we come from God's essence, really God's essence, why do we find that Jews, human beings could sin, go against God's will? I mean, we don't know such people ourselves, but it happens in some other countries. How is it possible that uh, angels, which are lesser, only the word of God, align with God perfectly? But we, uh, who are God's essence, uh, we can fracture a law here and there. So how is that? That's why the author Rebbe said, Lamaila. The way they are found above, we, in truth, their essence, before we come down here, we are much greater and much higher. And at that level, we're actually awesome. And, and, and we don't need the angels. And we are called by God's name. And we are we are standing in the most loftiest place. We can't go against God's will. Souls in heaven, it's amazing. It's more than angels. When we come down to this world, Hashem needed us to fit into the physical body and to fit into the physical story and to have a physical journey. And to do that, he had it bring us also into the world of what's called words, not just breath, but he also said, Nasa Adam et Salmenu, let us make man. And by saying these words, he, he allowed us to actually fit. You know, sometimes you can't put, like in these styrofoam cups, you can't put gasoline. I know that. I tried it once. Uh, <laughs> you buy Because it melts in a second. The cup melts. I was trying once to clean. Don't ask what I was trying to do. Anyway, <laughs> bottom line is, not everything, a small paper cup can't hold this. You know, certain things... If it's not a right vessel, it can't contain it. The human body can't contain the godly soul. It's not possible. It's like it's, it's, it's like trying to fill up a you know a bathtub with a with a fire with a or a cup of cup of water with a with a fireman's hose. You can't do it. So what did Hashem do? Hashem put a concealment of words on our soul. So we come down to this world while in our essence we are unbelievably powerfully and 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 we'll get to that in a minute. That untouchable and un amazing. At the same time, we could we function in a world where we could be regular. And could make a mistake and could we do have to come out to the help of angels, etc. That's why above before he said Lamail, and here he says, let's read these last two lines again inside. Um the first word on the line is it's right under the parentheses, two lines under the parentheses. Then the soul of man also came down into this world, into this lower level. Through the level of words. When Hashem said, let us make man. Why? In order to be able to fit into the physical body that we have to live in. Which means our souls have to come and in a harmonious way live within the physical body. And that's why he says, That's why only angels are called B'Shem Alekim. Because of the God of the gods, meaning the gods of the angels, uh, etc., etc. We'll go back to that uh, next week when we continue this. Now, do we have time for one more point? Uh, we have another few minutes, so we'll stop. Another few minutes? Oh, we'll stop here. We'll stop here. Next week, uh, we'll start off by going back and examining the following point. We're going to ask a question, and we're going to compare the statements here to the statements in chapter 2. In chapter 2, we explained also about the Chilek Elikai Amal. If you remember when we introduced chapter two of Tanya, going back to four years ago, when we said this, learn this, it says, and the second soul is an actual part of God. And we're going to find two or three very significant differences in how we describe the soul in chapter two, or how we describe the soul here, even though we use the same verse, very different, and explain why, and it's a very important understanding of our journey and who we are. We'll stop here, and Hashem shall bless all of us with an easy fast, and may Tisha B'Av be a Yom Tif. And that's going to be when Mashiach comes, we'll rejoice and celebrate. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. And everyone have a beautiful, healthy day and a healthy week. Amen. Too. Well. Nice to be back here. <laughs> I said a very interesting